Good morning and welcome to worship here at Arapaho United Methodist Church in Richardson, Texas, or wherever you're worshiping from. My name is Eliana Rios and I serve as one of the pastors here at AUMC. We want to just say that we're so happy that you have decided to worship here this morning. And if this is your first time tuning into worship, or if you've been tuning in for a while and haven't filled out the I'm New Connection form, make sure you go do that. We invite you to fill it out so a pastor can reach out to you and give you a big, warm Arapaho welcome. You can do that at our website at arapahoumc.org slash new. The best way to know what's going on in the life and ministry of the church and how to stay engaged is to make sure you're signed up for the newsletter. And you can do that at the website as well at arapahoumc.org slash newsletter. And today is Baptism of the Lord Sunday. We're going to be remembering our baptism towards the end of Pastor Scott's sermon as a part of worship today. So take a moment, go grab a cup or a bowl and fill it with water, and any water will do. And as we prepare to remember our baptism, get the candle you have in your home and light it. And as you light it, remember that you are God's beloved. Remember that God's presence is with you wherever you go, wherever you are. And may we all hear the ways in which God is calling us today. May we hear God's voice. Welcome to worship. Here at Arapaho, we are a praying community. 
And we want to take this opportunity to thank God for all of the prayers answered. And we want to take a time to thank God for those um, that have been in the hospital and that are now at home and those that are on their road to recovery. And we want to lift up and celebrate Kat Rocha, Ruth Legro, Luke Childs and his family, Shirley Howard, and Keith Bass. And friends, join me now um, as we continue to pray for our community, for our church, and for ourselves. Pray with me. God of mercy and God of love, we come before you with gratitude, but also with heavy hearts. We thank you for those that are now home and that are on their road to recovery. And God, we pray right now in this moment for our healthcare and frontline workers. Continue to give them strength as they care for the world. And God, it is with heavy hearts that we come to you because of what happened on Wednesday with the attack at the Capitol. God, there are people grieving for various reasons. But God, we wanna lift up the officer who died and his family. May you be with the family as they mourn. And we also put into your hands the families of those who also died on Wednesday that we can't name right now, but you know them. We pray, God, as they grieve. God, in the days that are to come, we know that they will not be easy, and we want to pray for those who hold public office. We pray for wisdom and guidance and for their leadership. And God, as a people, we know that our fight for justice continues. God, we are still the people walking. We are still people in the dark, and the darkness looms large around us. God, we're surrounded by fear, anxiety, brutality, violence, loss, and a dozen alienations that we cannot manage. God, we are, and we could be, people of your light. So we pray for the light of your glorious presence as we wait for your appearing. We pray for the light of your wondrous grace as we exhaust our coping capacity. We pray for your gift of newness that will override weariness. We pray that we may see and know and hear and trust in your good rule. That we may have energy, courage, and freedom to enact your rule all throughout the demands of this day. We submit our day to you. We submit ourselves to your rule with deep joy and high hope. And we pray, God, now, as your son taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Listen now as we read these words. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now. 
for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, and for the Word of God within us, thanks be to God. This week, I'm joining you from my own home as I learned late this week that a member of my family may have been exposed to the coronavirus. So until we can get accurate testing for our family, we'll be self-quarantining. The staff and leaders at AUMC are committed to doing all that we can to aid the efforts of our healthcare professionals in continuing to battle the ongoing surge of COVID-19. So welcome to the pulpit for this week. And let's talk about this week. As a preacher, I always try to approach crafting a sermon in the way articulated by 20th century theologian Karl Barth, who famously said that we should hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Just as we cannot separate our faith from our personal lives, we also cannot separate our faith from the events of this world, especially in the Christian season of Epiphany, when we celebrate the incarnational nature of God, the fact that God loved the world so much that God made a home in it, in the flesh, as Jesus. I was on a Zoom call this past Wednesday afternoon when I received a text from Ann Gore, our leadership board chair, asking if we could push back our meeting a day. Fine by me, I thought. I could use the extra time to catch up on my emails. Then I got a message from Pastor Kathy, and then a few friends, and then some family, each lamenting some sort of breaking news, but none naming specifically what had happened. And that's when I turned on the news and saw what I trust each of you did, a protest that had devolved into a violent riot an armed insurrection. Images of angry mobs violently invading Congress for the first time since the War of 1812. Video of terrified politicians and their staffers barricading themselves in their offices, wondering if the gallows erected outside was a symbol or meant actually for them. Perhaps the most startling picture was this image of the man who came in tactical gear and equipped with heavy-duty zip-tie handcuffs designed for hostage-taking. It doesn't take an elaborate imagination to know what he had come to do. It was a scene we are accustomed to seeing in third-world countries where democracy is perhaps being established, not in the cradle of our own democracy. When we witness domestic terrorism and insurrection in our own country's capital, when, when flags declaring Jesus is Lord fly alongside Confederate flags and next to signs calling for the murder of political opponents, when white supremacy is on full display as a rioting mob is met with little resistance for hours on end, when conspiracy-driven extremists seek to intimidate not just political parties or a political figure, but anyone who does not share their very narrow and false view of reality, they chanted hang pence along with hang Pelosi. When that is the newspaper, you find yourself holding along with the Bible. It's not a question of what do you say. It quickly becomes a question of where do you start. In the Christian calendar, this Sunday is called Baptism of the Lord Sunday. It's a day we traditionally commemorate Jesus' baptism and remember our own baptism as a covenant community. The more I sat with this week's news knowing our faith has a lot to say about not only how we process what happened, but also how we proceed. The more I sat with that, the more I felt myself drawn to the waters of baptism and the story of Jesus's baptism in the Gospel of Matthew. It's a brief story, but there's more happening there than may first meet the eye. And in a few short verses, Matthew opens up the concept of baptism in a new and powerful way for the Christian community, for us. Matthew sets the scene by telling us this. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. You know, locations are always important in Scripture. And the location of Jesus' baptism is no different. First, 
It divided both symbolically and literally the, the promised land of Israel from the wilderness of the outside. In this story of Jesus' identity being revealed to John the Baptist in the larger world, Jesus' own identity is wrapped up in being located on a border, on a boundary, and making this his home. But secondly, the River Jordan was just that, a river, a living water, as Scripture tells us, as opposed to a standing pool like, say, the Dead Sea, where the Jordan River actually ends. In his Jewish tradition, Living water was necessary for the most powerful of cleansing rituals. So it certainly makes sense that Jesus would choose the Jordan for this moment. But this Sunday, let me suggest something more may be happening here. I've been to the Jordan River. I went with a team of students several years ago while I was in seminary. We were there right around Orthodox Christmas, which incidentally meant that Russian tourists were everywhere. Now, I know this week has been heavy, but I process through humor sometimes, do you? Can I share something kind of funny with you today? I know we were surrounded by Russian tourists, not because I speak Russian or because I got to meet a whole lot of them, but because for some reason, Russian groups in Israel frequently wear track suits with the word Russia emblazoned in all caps across their backs. It was like being at the River Jordan with the Russian Olympic team or something. But then again, American tourists are famous for wearing American flag polos and stuff all the time. So maybe we just each have our own favorite patriotic travel attire of choice. Anyways, I didn't have the chance to officially remember my baptism, as we say, in the Jordan River. But I did stick my feet in. And friends, it was frigid. I mean, ice water cold. Some of the coldest water I've ever felt. Granted, it was January. But I actually swam in the Dead Sea at the same time, and it was downright pleasant. And with the high salt, co salt content in the Dead Sea, you float incredibly easily. It's almost surreal. And the mud at the Dead Sea is a highly prized exfoliant. If you wanted to rest and relax, the Dead Sea is practically spa day. The Jordan River, by contrast, is a surprising bucket of ice water. And Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, not the Dead Sea. Jesus chose living water over water at rest. He chose a cold current over a warm respite. I bring this up to say this. Baptism is not the still waters that grant us rest. It is God's current in which we are caught. Baptism is not the still waters that grant us rest. It is God's current in which we are caught. Baptism was the beginning of Christ's ministry in the world. It was how he chose to begin really living and working as God's son on earth. And yet we so frequently treat it as a finish line in the church today. The reality is, Baptism is a living water that calls us to join the great river of faith and to be about God's love on the move. The baptismal moment reminds me of the famous words found in Amos, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When we enter and remember the waters of baptism, we join this great current of faith and commit ourselves to continuing this faithful work. Now, now, Matthew can hear us asking, what kind of faithful work are we to begin, Matthew? And so he continues and writes this. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. And then he consented. The scene is fascinating because it, it represents a debate that continued throughout the early centuries of the Christian church. If Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, the, the perfected vision of humanity alive in the flesh, if Jesus was without sin, then why would he need to be baptized? Remember, John claims the same Jewish tradition just like Jesus. And this ritual was about personal cleansing. Even in living water, cleansing the deepest of sins, this wasn't something Jesus apparently needed. 
the word at the center of this question comes when Jesus says it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. We've seen that word before. We saw it almost every week in Advent as it was used to describe Joseph and Mary and Zechariah as a way of saying they lived in line with God's will. In the Methodist tradition, baptism is an outward sign of the grace of God at work in the lives of all people. And in the case of older children and teens and adults, it's a sign of their spirit being made right, like Joseph and Mary and Zechariah, in the eyes of God. But there's more to that word righteousness. There's, there's more to baptism, in fact. Righteousness can refer to the way a person lives according to God's will, but it can also refer to the way that our larger world lives according to God's will. Another word for that is justice. God's love and will at work in the world, justice, righteousness and justice were one and the same in this one word that Jesus uses. And so suddenly, Jesus' baptism begins to make more sense, and our baptism takes on more meaning as well. Jesus isn't getting baptized simply to cleanse himself. He's receiving baptism as one who now intends to set right not just his own personal soul, but the world as well. So often, the concept of baptism in American Christianity is reduced to a completely individualistic thing. We've treated it like this magic trick that we perform to help people go to heaven. But it's always been about so much more than us or being personally saved. It's about not only marking God's work in our lives, it's about marking our lives for God's work in the world. Baptism is less about bringing us to heaven and more about bringing heaven to earth. Is it any wonder why immediately after Jesus rises from the waters, the heavens split open as if to say, here we come. Jesus begins this work that we continue, this ushering in of the kingdom of God. Yes, through our own personal work of growing closer to God and developing that righteousness within, but also through embodying the love of God, that living justice in the world around us so that it becomes impossible to see where earth stops and heaven starts. And what does heaven on earth look like? What does that work require? Matthew again hears us asking. And again, he offers a response. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. You know, when we spend enough time in the Christian faith, Sometimes we can forget the power of really basic, key concepts. I, I know I do this all the time. The Son of God. The Son of God. Now that's a phrase I've spoken countless times and I've heard and read even more. This is the first time anyone listening to Matthew's gospel has heard Jesus' identity spoken so plainly. He's been Mary's son. He's been hailed as the Messiah by John the Baptist. But now there's no fuzz on it anymore. God's own voice cries out, this is my son. No longer do we have a prophet who tells us about God or, or a priest who teaches us God's movement in the scriptures. Instead, we have something new, entirely different and more potent. Theologian Sarah Dillon Brewer puts it this way. When we say that Jesus is God's son, going about the family business, we're saying not only that Jesus is like God, we're saying that God is like Jesus. If you want to know what heaven on earth looks like, look to Jesus, Matthew says. Watch his work, listen to his voice, witness righteousness and justice at work in the world. And so for 25 more chapters, Matthew will show us precisely what heaven on earth looks like, the kind of work that we have before us. It's cleansing lepers and flipping tables. It's calming storms and casting out demons. It's granting voice to the voiceless and speaking truth to power. It's feeding the 5,000 and gathering at one table with tax collectors and prostitutes. It's welcoming children and rejecting false prophets. It's laying down arms and resisting the urge towards violence. It's crossing borders and picking up crosses. It's the same work that it's always been. Love God and love neighbor. 
but it's not just in our sanctuaries or in our scrolls. This time it is in our midst, and its name is Jesus. The same Jesus who will say to us, just before ascending into heaven, now go and make disciples of all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You've seen what heaven looks like on earth He says, now now invite the world to join the ever-flowing stream of faith. Make my righteousness your own, says Jesus, and make justice the reality for this, my home. And so today, we come to remember our own baptism, our initiation into the body of Christ, and our covenant to commit our lives to God's work in the world. If you have a source of water ready, I've got the bowl from our sanctuary. I invite you to draw it near you now. And I'll ask you our historical questions found in the United Methodist Book of Worship, along with words that fit the spirit of today. And together, we will renew our baptismal covenant. So I ask you now, in the community and presence of the church, with the Holy Spirit, Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? My friends, do you sense God stirring you from your slumber? Do you feel the cold waters of righteousness rushing over your face? Do you relent to the current catching you up in God's love on the move? If you do, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? My friends, do you share God's love for the world and invite heaven upon the earth? Do you embrace the personal and systemic work that leads us not only to uproot sin, but also to embody justice? Do you stand as an ally to the poor and the powerless, willing to lower yourself so that God could be exalted? If you do, say, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. My friends, do you see God in the eyes of Jesus? Do you see Jesus in the eyes of each other? Do you see each other as belonging to a kingdom where racism, white supremacy, and nationalism give way to God's equity, justice, and love beyond borders? If you do, say, I do. At this time, take whatever water is before you. Remember your baptism. Friends, the violence that we saw on Wednesday was not an isolated incident. It was the latest visible symptom of deeper-seated sins present within our culture. And just as Wednesday did not exist within a vacuum, our work will not disappear overnight, in two weeks, in two years, or even over the course of our lifetimes. Our work is not dependent upon the occupant of the White House. It continues until heaven is at home upon the earth. As we pray for healing and unity and peace within our nation, may we remember that healing can be painful. Unity requires accountability and mutual respect. And peace will be felt where justice is found. It sounds like work. Compared to this week, it sounds a lot like heaven. You feel the water flowing. Is the current catching you? Remember your baptism. Know you are beloved. Bring a bit of heaven down. Amen.
Well, this week, it'll be halfway through January, and hopefully you're keeping your resolutions up. Uh, This week's invitation is pretty simple. Um, In 2021, we'll continue our food services with Austin Street Center. Maybe you know about Austin Street from the Normathon on the ticket, or uh, maybe you've been to serve, as so many of you have. And what we do with Austin Street is uh, a large group of people prepare food. Um, Several times a year, we prepare food. And when we're not in COVID, we're able to go and serve the food. But during COVID, we're not allowed in the building due to restrictions. So what we're asking is on Saturday, January 23rd, um, if if you sign up to prepare food, you'll deliver that food on the 23rd from noon to 1 p.m. And then you can also sign up to go and deliver the food. We're just dropping it at the center. So that's a pretty short and, and fairly simple way to serve. Um, If you're unable to help with food this time around, there'll be more opportunities coming through the year. But you can also give at arapoumc.org slash donate. You'll find in the drop-down menu um, an Austin Street Street button you can press there. So this year, uh, you can also donate jeans and a few other items, and you can find that on our website. Uh, Also in January, we want to invite you to um, our monthly book club. Uh, maybe you follow Glennon Doyle on Twitter or Instagram, and so you know all about this book. Um, it's a pretty big deal in 2020 when she wrote this book called Untamed. Um, the book is about how to be brave, and sometimes when we're working at our bravest, we tend to get lucky sometimes. And so, um, so if you would, just read the book, um, and then you can join the, the, the book discussion on Thursday, Janu- January 28th. That's Thursday, January 28th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. You'll sign up for both of those and many of our other small groups or service opportunities at www.arapoumc.org connect. That's the easiest place to get signed up to anything we have upcoming. Thank you for being in worship with us today. And I want to say thank you for your continued generosity through the ministries here at Arapaho. And today I have a special opportunity for generosity for all of us. Uh, maybe you received some recent stimulus money like my family did. And maybe like my family, you're, you're really not in need of that right now. And you look around and you see the individuals and families who are on the brink of eviction and you want to find a way to help. Well, we as Arapaho want to stand in that gap and be a part of the help. So whether you received stimulus monies or not, if you would like to give towards rent assistance right now uh, to help make that possible for individuals and families who need it, uh, we are going to be directing 100% of our mission fund dollars that are received this week, starting this Sunday, running till next Sunday, 100% of the dollars received to our mission fund will be applied to rent assistance locally here in the DFW area. And so uh, go to our website, arapahoumc.org, and when you donate, you can click a, do- a drop down box and see mission fund is an option there. You have this full calendar week uh, to make that donation. And I wanna say thank you in advance for those of you who choose to, I know my, my family will be contributing to this cause and is a worthy cause at that. Of course, there are multiple ways to give. If you want to support the general ministries of Arapaho, again, you can go to our website, arapahoumc.org slash donate. You can also go to the number that you see on your screen and text the word give to this phone number on your phone, and that will initiate our giving portal. Lastly, you can always uh, give via check by mailing that to 1400 West Arapaho Road, Richardson, Texas, 75080. And now I offer you some parting words of peace. May we go from God's church into God's world, remembering our baptism and thankful, allowing ourselves to be caught up in the stream of God's love on the move with both righteousness and justice, not just for ourselves, but for our world. Bring a bit of heaven down this week. Go in peace. Amen.